Well, I'm so grateful for your joining us here tonight for a Bible study. It's hard to imagine. It is September the 22nd. We are now officially in fall. I hope it's been a good summer for you, but I'm sure like for all of us, it's been a challenging year so far. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we do pray for your healing to be upon us and upon this world. We ask you continue to help us to put our faith in you as we look up to you and trust that you're going to provide for us. Continue to be with those doctors and nurses, the surgeons, uh, the researchers, uh, the aides, and all those who help with those who are sick and those who are trying to deliver us to that day where we can gather back together as we have always done and worship you and, and, and hug each other and just uh, be with our families and just pray that you deliver us for that day soon because I know we're all a little bit tired of this season, but we do know it is just for a time and look forward to that deliverance. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Boy, you know, today is kind of endemic, and I say today, this day, this age is kind of very similar to what the people of Israel were going through, isn't it? They were looking and yearning for their deliverance, and they had to trust in God. And, and see if you can put your mind in the people and, 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 and reflect upon what the people of Israel were going through and what they were thinking, because I guarantee you were probably thinking some of the exact same thoughts. That's what's so wonderful about the story of the book of Exodus. It is meant to be a timeless story that we can use to look at those seasons and those times where we've got our backs against the wall. And so remember where we left off last week in the lesson, how the people of Israel were freed from Egypt, from their slavery, and what did they come up against? They came up against a physical barrier that they couldn't pass, a sea of reeds. So in front of the sea of reeds, behind them, the Egyptian army. The army that represents all, uh, all of the forces which defy God. Remember, this is meant to be a timeless story. So we're not supposed to know who the Pharaoh is, when this took place. I, again, am not saying that it didn't take place. What I am saying is there's no time frame for this. We don't know when this story took place. And anybody who claims, well, I know when the story took place, they don't know what they're talking about. There is absolutely zero evidence of when this story took place. There's a time frame of about four or five hundred years that it could have taken place, but we don't know. You're not supposed to know. So the army of the Egyptians is a representative army. Was it a real army? Absolutely. But it's meant to be something symbolic and representative of something for us. The army that represents all of the forces which defy God. Or, 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 you can put it this way. Tar, Aot, Wadig. There you go, that's the way to remember it. Oops, I forgot the F in there. Fwadig. I know, that's really bad, isn't it? i got to rethink this thing. The army representing all of the forces which defy God, a.k.a. the Egyptian army, to their, in, right, to their back and in front of them an impassable uh, barrier, and God delivered them. Amazing. So now they're free. Free of the Egyptian army. The army uh, representing all of the forces which defy God has now been destroyed. So now they have to deal with one other enemy. Guess who that enemy is? They've got one other enemy, and it's themselves. <laughs> Isn't this so like life? Do you remember themselves? There's an S there. Trust me, it's there. You may not see it, it's there. Themselves, they are their worst enemies. Isn't that true of us in life? So the very first thing that the Jews do, once they're delivered from freedom, uh, once they're delivered from the Egyptian army and all the forces that do, defy God, the very first thing they do is they start to complain. Are you kidding me? Did you bring us all the way out here just to, to die here, Moses? Let me read this lesson to you. It's crazy. So here they are delivered. The whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The sons of Israel said to them, Would that we have died by the Lord's hands in the land of Egypt when we sat by pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full. They kind of have a warped memory, don't they, of what their past was in Egypt. Already, they're like a month out, maybe. And they're already warped their memories of what it was like to be slaves 
in Egypt. Trust me, they didn't eat till they were full of bread. And their plates weren't full of meat. But this is the way they're remembering it. For you brought us out into the wilderness to kill us and this entire assembly with hunger. Aw, oh, poor babies. Then the Lord <coughs> said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instructions. On the sixth day, that's important, when they prepare, what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they should gather daily than what they do gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to the sons of Israel, At evening you will know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. In the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your grumblings against the Lord. And what are we that you would grumble against us? I mean, huh, it's okay you grumble against God. This is funny because, again, it's Moses. Grumble against God. He's the one that brought you out here. Don't grumble against me. It's his fault. <laughs> Verse 8, Moses then said, This will happen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and bread in the full of the morning, for the Lord hears your grumblings, which you grumble against him. And are we, and what are we? Your grumblings are not against us, but the Lord. So Moses said to Aaron, that's what passing the buck, right? Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the congregation, sons of Israel, come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumblings. So it came about, and Moses, Aaron spoke to the whole congregation, the sons of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud. And the Lord spoke to Moses and said, Do you notice a cloud? That's important. I don't have time to really emphasize that. But this was very much the theology uh, in the Old Testament. Theology, not just of the Jews, but God always came out of a cloud. These, these, these uh, uh, oftentimes would come out of the clouds, this kind of, represented the presentation of God. That was true also in Canaanite theology, that God, God of thunder, God of the clouds, God of the mountains, these things are very common themes. And this is how God reveals himself. So you know there's a revelation of God in these clouds here today. Whenever you see cloud, oh, God is going to reveal himself. That's true. You'll notice that also in the book of Job, this happens. The cloud comes and God reveals himself. And so it just something to keep in mind that this is a common theme in the Old Testament. So the Lord spoke to Moses and said, oh, by the way, New Testament, right? Jesus, transfiguration, cloud, meant to reflect upon this lesson. Just saying. Next time you read New Testament transfiguration, think Old Testament, book of Exodus. So <laughs> going on. Verse 12, I've heard your grumblings, the sons of Israel. Speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall eat meat in the morning, and you shall be filled with bread, and you will know that I am the Lord your God. So it came about in the evening, the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp, and when the layer of dew evaporated, behold, the surface of the wilderness, there was a fine flake-like thing, fine as a frost in the ground. So when the sons of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? That's where we get the word manna, right? What is it? For they did not know what it was, but Moses said to them, It is the bread which the Lord God has given you to eat. Amazing. Okay. So again, the Jews were delivered. The very first thing they do is they complain. I mean, this isn't what I thought it would be like, God. Come on. When are we going to eat? We're hungry and thirsty. Moses, are we almost there yet? And Moses is sitting there saying, Hey, people, stop your griping and complaining. Don't make me pull over this car. Because I got to pull over this car, you're in deep trouble, right? You've heard that growing up. I had two other brothers. And yeah, this happened all the time in my household whenever we drove somewhere. I bet you we drove my mother crazy, okay? And the people of Israel, they're drama queens. Oh, God, you should, God should just, verse 3. Let me read this to you again. It's funny. It's supposed to be funny. Verse 3, the sons of Israel said, what, Would that we had died by the Lord's hands in the land of Egypt when we sat by pots of meat and we ate bread to the full. For you brought us out in the wilderness to kill us. Yeah, really. <laughs> there were more effective ways to kill them. God could have just closed up the Red Sea on them. No, come on. They're drama queens. God delivered them. God just delivered them. But they did not trust that God would provide. Now, I would laugh at that in one sense, and I kind of am laughing, except there's one problem. This is me. 
and I guarantee it's you too. You are just like the Jews after having been delivered by God's hand out of Egypt and crossed through an impassable barrier, were protected from an army of all the forces that would defy God, and 30 seconds later were saying, why doesn't God care for me anymore? You've done that, I've done that. I tell you, and I, I, I'm kind of this from experience, I will have mornings where it's like the sun is out and everything's bright and beautiful and there's a wonderful soundtrack going through my head, oh, isn't it a great and beautiful day? And then all of a sudden I stub my toe or I can't find my keys or, or I've misplaced this or somebody hit my car and now I've got a bashed in front end or something like that. I don't know, these crazy things that really in the long run don't mean a lot. And we're just like, how could God not care for me? Why would God do this to me? This is the way we act in life. We are very predictable as human beings. Do you remember how I said that in the Bible, humans are very predictable? God is the one we cannot predict. God is the most unpredictable character in the Bible. Humans are very predictable. Over and over and over again. Just read the book of 1 and 2 Kings. And then they did what was evil in God's sight. And then they did what was evil in God's sight. And then they did what was evil in God's sight. Over and over again, we fall into the same traps. God provides for us. We celebrate before the celebration is done. God, why would you do this to me? We stub our toes. God, I can't believe you would treat me this way. We are just like the Jews. We're supposed to understand and see ourselves and their behavior not well, we can mock them because we're mocking ourselves. We are the Jews, delivered from freedom, blessed by God, and yet we're always complaining that we don't have enough. Oh, there's us. You know, I, I know uh, people have been through life-threatening diseases, maybe cancer, and they're, they're, they're healed of that in a spectacular way, maybe, or maybe just through medicine. Either way, it's a spectacular thing, and you say, my life is never going to be the same again. I will never take life for granted until, you know, six months down the road, a year down the road, you get back to life just the way it's always been. You forget about the cancer. You forget about the things that are in your rearview mirror. You're grateful for it when you think about it, but your life just gets back to normal. And I say this from experience. Because my daughter nearly died in childbirth. My wife nearly child, died in, in childbirth. I'm so grateful I got both of them. And I tell you, after this happened, I was like, I'll never take life for granted again. Bull. <laughs> Within a year, my life was back to normal and I was acting just the same way. It didn't really long-term change my life. On occasion, I think about it and I remind myself of this because that's what I want to do. I want to get back to that day where I don't take life for granted and I just realize the many blessings of God. But I'm very predictable, and so are you. <laughs> Notice once again, what does God do? So we're complaining, we're griping, we're crying. God provides. I mentioned to you that sixth day. You were supposed to, again, here in the sixth day, Genesis chapter 1. Creation, sixth day the ending of creation, seventh day. The whole purpose of Genesis 1 is the seventh day. That's what creation is all about. The seventh day when God does what? Rests amongst God's people. That's the whole purpose of creation. God with us. So that's the emphasis here. On the seventh day, God hasn't forgotten us. You might think that God has forgotten you, but the seventh day is coming. That Sabbath day, when God will reside amongst us. It's a reminder, you see, that God hasn't forgotten us. And so God, what does God do? God provides quails in the p.m. God provides manna in the morning. And oh, by the way, another thing that you should be hearing as far as our Christian theology goes, the manna from in heaven, who is Jesus? The bread of life. See, in Jewish thinking, the Messiah, when the Messiah comes, would provide manna from heaven just like Moses did. So you're supposed to, whenever the New Testament mentions bread or, manna or bread from heaven or Jesus affiliated or related to bread, the Holy Communion meal, the Last Supper, bread, 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 you are supposed to think of this, 
God's provision. Who is Jesus? God's provision. God's sufficiency. Okay? God's provided. We gripe, we complain, we're very predictable, but God doesn't sit there, get your life together. No, what does God say? I hear you. I'm still going to provide for you. Yeah, you guys gripe all the time. But I haven't forgotten you. I understand. God does understand our doubts. We're going through a tough season right now. You are all doubting sometimes. You're all frustrated. God understands. We are frail. And this is what I'm going to leave you with today. We're frail. But God is going to provide for us. It's okay. I'm here to remind you of that. Because I know you doubt too. I doubt too. God understands our lack of faith. When I doubt, I'm hoping that there's somebody in my life that will remind me. It's okay. God's got it under control. That's what we do for each other in my family. There are times that I get frustrated and I doubt. My wife is the one who's the calm voice of reason. It's okay. God will provide. And there are times that she's freaking out. And I'm just, I can't believe this. I can't believe this. I'm there to remind her, it's okay. God will provide. We're there for each other. Because we're predictable, we're humans, we doubt, we get frustrated, we get blessed by God, and 30 seconds later, we're feeling like God is against us. It's okay. We're very predictable. God accepts us as we are, and God still provides for us. God is here to be a reassurance in our time of need. I have you. I got you. So maybe you're feeling overwhelmed today. Here's, this lesson's for you. It's a timeless lesson. I got you. I understand your doubts, your gripes, your complaints. I got you. And I won't let you go. Let's pray. Holy Father, these, these lessons are so hopeful. We see ourselves in them. We doubt. You just blessed us. We doubt. But you don't kick us under the carpet or under the rug. You don't kick us out in the streets. You say, it's okay. I got you. God, we thank you for having us today, for providing for us. And God, when we do doubt, we just ask you to provide us others to remind us, just that, that, that reassuring voice, not with a finger pointing in our face, reassuring voice, God has us. It's okay. God understands. We thank you for this reassurance in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you and keep you and send you forth in peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray.